His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Good morning. Great to see you all this morning. Welcome to this service of worship as we continue with our theme, the songs of Christmas, the songs of Advent during this Advent season. It is good to have you here on this third Sunday of Advent, and we invite you to continue coming uh, next Sunday and then on Christmas Eve for our lessons of our, for our service of lessons and carols, which will be at five o'clock on Christmas Eve. So plan to be with us for for all of that. I want to thank uh, Suzanne Rushworth, the Presbyterian Women, for a wonderful event Wednesday night. Uh, we had a very nice dinner and fun with some games. That was a, a great a great time. Uh, Thursday night here was a beautiful performance by the Choral Arts Group of Chattanooga and uh, just uh, had a wonderful turnout and a beautiful concert here with them. Uh, so uh, always glad to uh, host those music events. This coming Wednesday, the St. Matthew Shelter Men will be our guests for a Christmas dinner. And uh, we invite you all to come and join with them as we have a little Christmas uh, Wednesday night. And um, so that will be going on Wednesday. Um, also want to say, uh, finally, a, a huge thank you to Sandy Franklin. I know uh, many folks helped to decorate, uh, but it was just so beautiful Thursday night for the Choral Arts concert. Um, thank you all so much for making this sanctuary uh, even more beautiful this time of year. I know Sandy uh, does a tremendous amount of work uh, to get all of this in place, so we thank her so much. Uh, beautiful, beautiful place. You'll see in your bulletin that uh, one of the special offerings that we take this time of year is called the Christmas Joy Offering. Uh, this offering benefits really two groups of people for uh, retired uh, Presbyterian pastors and church workers who may not have had a very substantial retirement fund put away for them. Um, it does help them with assistance. Um, and then also it benefits um, our communities of color uh, students who are seeking an education at one of our racial ethnic colleges. So it provides scholarships and education for them as well. So both of those things uh, go into the Christmas Joy Offering. You'll find the envelopes there in front of you in the pew. Uh, so please uh, give generously to that. We appreciate it. And finally, I want to announce um, that we lost one of our saints uh, this week, Elizabeth Houston, uh, who has been uh, living at Life Care Center of Red Bank, uh, has gone on to meet her Lord and uh, is safely in the arms of Jesus. She has been uh, a legend, uh, quite, quite a personality, quite a figurehead. Uh, here in this church. I know uh, lots of you share history with her, and so uh, while we grieve her passing, uh, we also celebrate uh, that for her, uh, she has gone on to eternal life. There will be a service next Saturday at 2 o'clock here at the church. Uh, Reverend Frank Jump will be leading that. I will be participating, and we invite all of you to come. Her son, uh, Fitz, will be coming from California, uh, so he will be here, and uh, just invite us to be a community of faith uh, together for him. So that will be happening next Saturday. Any other announcements for us this morning? We have our children singing. We 
have our wonderful choir. It's a wonderful time to be here. Let us worship God. Please join me in a responsive reading. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for you have looked favorably upon your people. You have raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of servant David. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and guide our feet into the way of peace. As this season of Sparkle and Bride unfolds around us, the silent prayers of peace lie like stars hidden in a clouded night. May we inspire the world with peace. May we touch it in every place of stress, frustration, or fear, so we might feel the presence of peace easing our hearts and transforming our lives. And may we share its healing power with our children that they might become the inspiration through which peace makes its way to a new world. Let us pray. God of hope, Prince of Peace, you speak peace into the world. The way of the Christ child lights our path to live in peace that we may be called children of God. God of hope, God of love, God of peace. Into the darkness come.
May peace light the world this Christmas. We come together in part because we know that as a body of believers, we have not lived up to all that we could be, especially during this season, for we know that we are incapable of being the full people that God has created us to be. But we also know that when we turn to God, when we ask for forgiveness, when we can relieve ourselves of the guilt and anger and frustration that weigh upon us, God is faithful and just and will forgive us. Let us then join in our prayer of confession. God of abounding grace, have mercy upon us. Our valleys are deep when we get overwhelmed by having to care. Our mountains are high when our burdens get heavy. We grope in the maze of demands and the pain of bad choices. Forgive us for putting so many concerns before our trust in you. Show us the straight path and the smooth way that lead to your righteousness. 
Help us believe what you tell us. Let us continue our prayer in silence. Amen. There is not enough silence in our lives and in our world these days. There is lots of noise and lots of busyness that would distract us. But we know that when we can take a deep breath, we will find that God is there waiting for us continuing to love us in spite of what we've been, in spite of what we continue to be. God is always ready to receive us. Friends, believe this good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Stand. Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Malachi, the third chapter, verses 1 through 4, and you can find it in your pew Bible in the Old Testament section on page 838. For myself, I've always found these verses to give context to the challenges that happen in my life. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soap, he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
children are giving us a special selection today, led by Deborah Noblet and Rick Rushworth. We appreciate our children participating this way today.
We are again in the Gospel of Luke and the first chapter, verses 67 through 79. This is Zechariah's song. Then his father, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Four men were in a hospital waiting room because their wives were having babies. Finally, a nurse approached the first man and said, Congratulations, you're the father of twins. That's odd, answered the man. I work for the Minnesota twins. Another nurse said to the second man, Congratulations, you're the father of triplets. That's weird, answered the second man. I work for the 3M company. Then a nurse told the third man, Congratulations, you're the father of quadruplets. Wow, that's strange, the third man answered. I work for the Four Seasons Hotel. After all this, the fourth man started groaning and banging his head against the wall. What's wrong? the other men asked. You don't understand, said the fourth man. I work for 7-Eleven. <laughs> Fathers are usually happy to hear that their child is born. It is a time of great relief, assuming that child and mother are well. And it is a time of great accomplishment, supporting the woman through nine months of pregnancy, followed by labor and delivery. The father in our gospel lesson today had a strange reaction to the news that he and his wife would be parents. Luke's gospel begins with Zechariah, father to John the Baptist, who became the forerunner to Jesus. Luke tells us that Zechariah was a priest 
and that his wife Elizabeth was a descendant of Aaron, also a priest. They were righteous and blameless before God, according to all the commandments, but they had no children. And they were getting on in years. And so, right away, Luke's audience would recall another Old Testament story about a couple who didn't have children and who were getting on in years, and they too were old. They had visitors who told them they would become pregnant. And yes, this story is beginning to sound familiar, a lot like what happened with Abraham and Sarah. When Zechariah is chosen to enter the temple to perform one of the priestly duties, he is met by a strange visitor, the angel Gabriel, an angel who was quite busy that night. And he tells Zechariah that his prayer had been heard. Zechariah may have been thinking, well, which prayer is that? The angel told him that Elizabeth would bear a son and that his name would be John. And he would be great in the sight of the Lord. Huh? What did you say? Zechariah couldn't believe it. How will I know? My wife and I are old. The angel simply responded that he had been sent from God with this good news. But since Zechariah did not believe it, the angel told him that he would become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occurred. What happened? What was God doing in Zechariah? This key figure in the Christmas story, the one who heard that his son would go before the Messiah to make ready a people, to turn their hearts, to turn the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Suddenly, he couldn't talk. The people waiting for him realized that he had seen something, but he couldn't tell them what. He couldn't even tell Elizabeth. He must have written it down for Elizabeth. Wonder how she received the news. But how did Zechariah get through nine months of not talking? And how could Zechariah have not put it together that his descendants, Abraham and Sarah, had the same experience, with the same barrier of age? And remember how Sarah responded to the news of having a child? <laughs> she laughed. She and Abraham had the same disbelief. The consequence of his disbelief had to be worn for nine months. Despite being righteous and blameless, keeping all the commandments, something terrible happened to Zechariah. He wasn't able to speak. Isn't it comforting to know that bad things do happen to good people? But what was the point of his muteness?
Maybe Zechariah needed to see that being so righteous, perhaps rigid in his priestly function, in the work of the temple, perhaps it had closed him off to the unexpected, even the miraculous. A child in his old age was not within Zechariah's scope of possibilities. In Star Wars, when Yoda's use of the Force lifts a spacecraft that had sunk into slimy, swampy water, Luke Skywalker proclaims, I can't believe it! To which Yoda replies, that is why you fail. Zechariah, are you so full of ritual, so full of the right way to do things, so full of anxiety that you fail to see what God is promising? Are you so full of everything that there's no room for joy and for laughter and for the amazing? Zechariah received a wake-up call. Perhaps he was struck mute so that he would have to pay attention. Pay attention to the routine and to the surprises. Pay attention to the ways of God we are sure of and the ways we can't begin to fathom. Perhaps Zechariah also learned for himself that in order to receive miraculous news, one must be ready. One cannot take in or take on if one is already full to the brim. So maybe he learned that he needed to dump out. He needed to make room from within. In nine months of silence, Zechariah was reminded that God is faithful, that God keeps covenants, and that God is merciful. God also expects us to dump whatever fills us besides God's Spirit. That's why all four Gospels talk about Zechariah's son, John the Baptist, and his fiery message of repentance. Zechariah learned that Someone was going to be needed to get the world ready to receive Jesus. Zechariah, once he stepped out of his rigid mold, was made ready to parent a son who would prepare the way, who would make ready a people looking for the Messiah. John the Baptist came to confront us, to bring us into conflict within ourselves so that we may repent and change and change our lives to center on the holiness of God that invaded the world when Jesus came. Zechariah's song is, in a way, a kind of pause, almost an interruption in the narrative flow of Luke. What comes next is chapter 2, the most famous version of the Christmas story. This is what we're all eager to get to this month. We can't wait to jump into Luke 2, see again the manger, the baby, the shepherds, and the angels. 
But Luke forces us to pause. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Zechariah was forced to take a deep breath and exhale all the stuff that he was full of. And he passed that on to his son, a wild man who was free to be just what God needed. Breathe in. Breathe out. Zechariah's son used that technique in the way he baptized those who were ready to change. Take a deep breath. Be immersed in the waters of the Jordan. In other words, drown, die. Then rise up. Breathe out death. Breathe in God's cleansing and healing and new life. In the same way, every day, breathe out anger, breathe out pain, breathe out resentment and dependencies and fragilities. Breathe in God's light and God's peace. Stop. Step back. Be still. Don't speak. Then wake up to what's got to go inside of us to open ourselves to God's mercy with us. Observe Zechariah and believe his name is John. We're not ready for the Messiah until we let go, <clears throat> repent, and make room to receive him. Shall we pray? Gracious God, we thank you for Zechariah's fatherhood. We thank you that despite such a hardship, such a mystery, such an unknown, he followed you and finally believed in what you promised. Thank you, God, that even when we look for you, want you, want to see you, we sometimes feel that you are evasive. We can't quite touch you and know that you are present. Help us, God, with all of the stuff that swirls in our minds and in ourselves and in our families and in this world, that all of this stuff, God, will not take us away from what you have to offer your grace, your peace, your stillness, to know I am. Help us to pause. Help us to wake up, to see your spirit in our midst. Help us to trust and to believe that you are still at work in our lives for the sake of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together saying our Father
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I do want to say a special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us again today. It's always wonderful and breathes new life into us to have you here. So welcome. Be our guest for lunch that we always have following worship. We're so glad to have you all here. And with that, let us give thanks to God and let us do so at this time with our offering. God, we give you thanks always. We give you thanks for all that you give us. And God, we pray that as we return those gifts to you, they will be used for your service to spread light, to spread hope, and to spread love throughout this community and this world. For Jesus' sake, amen.
Breathe in. Breathe out. May the God of love, may Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is mercy with us, may the Spirit who fills our being, who calls us to love, who gives us all that we need every day, be upon us and with us, and may we take all of that throughout this week. Amen. Yeah, I, it's all kind of new to me. Uh, no, no, she said after lunch, and then we the, go across the street. <coughs> we have a short meeting of the Brookings and the session together. Is that with Yeah. Yeah, I think. I'm, I'm a little bit vague on it myself. But yes, and then after that, we're supposed to socialize. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm not much of a celebrator, to tell you the truth. Like I told Jeff, I said, you have to help me celebrate. I'm not the best celebrator. My wife's a good celebrator. She's the, she's the celebrator. She's the, I'm the dull. Well, she probably come. So, yeah. I think uh, Kathy would be the last word on that, but I think that's the drill, and it's going to be somewhere up to go in the back door, like where the office is. It's in a room or something. In that area, you don't go in these um, front doors here in St. Paul. I guess if they're open, you can go in here. Well, that's, that's where the 